senior year of high school. Um, Ken became a follower and committed his life to Jesus Christ. And since that time, he has committed his life to discipleship and to discipling others. Uh, Ken has a BS in mathematics from the University of Tennessee. Uh, he then graduated from Southwestern Univers uh, Seminary in Fort Worth, Texas. Um, he met his wife, Janet, there. She had recently graduated from TCU. Uh, they began uh, their um, part of their life's passion uh, in volunteering with Young Life at that time in Texas. Uh, they have three daughters, um, Megan, Molly, and Maggie. And Megan is married to Matt. <laughs> uh, he has some wonderful grandchildren. Um, Ken, for over 18 years, volunteered as a Young Life leader and then for 30 years has served on steering committees for Young Life. Uh, he was an elder at Perimeter Church. Uh, he's currently a member of Brookhaven Presbyterian Church, uh, where he's a candidate for elder nomination. Uh, Ken's been in the computer industry for over 35 years, uh, working with Hewlett Packard, Microsoft, and now Equinix. Um, and Ken's passion is theology with a focus on apologetics and discipleship. Uh, family time is one of Ken's or Ken's priority, but amidst all of that in his studies, he has somehow found a way to play on 643 different golf courses in 41 states and 12 countries around the world. So I know some of the questions, there will be questions following up Ken's talk may stem from some of these points. But again, we welcome Ken Webb and look forward to hearing from you this morning. Yes, um, uh, yeah, I have played a lot of golf. I had responsibility, I had a worldwide job with Microsoft, so there was uh, a lot of uh, traveling and opportunities to play golf in different parts of the world, um, and which was always very entertaining um, and, uh, and was uh, beneficial to, go, to be able to do that. Uh, one thing is I actually attended Southwestern Seminary. I don't want to disparage them by saying I actually graduated. Um, I attended there one year after college. I wanted to go to a seminary and I did that, went to Texas and then went into the computer world, uh, met my wife there. Um, so um, really, I kind of want to show you this. There's a thing, my, my wife and daughter uh, said, Ken, they don't want to see your business bio, we're going to help you write a bio. So they wrote a bio for me. That's a bio they wrote for me. Uh, they put together and wanted to make sure that I, that I put in there all the different uh, pieces. Um, this, uh, there's a, a little uh, thing going on right now on the internet. You do a picture of how things started and then a picture of how things are going. So we put the first next slide up. Um, this is how it started. This is my wife and I when we met. Um, and that's in Fort Worth, Texas, where she's from Oregon and went to TCU. Uh, and then uh, if you go to the next uh, slide, this is how it's going. So uh, there's a bunch of redheads. Uh, I'm no longer a redhead. Um, there's a, uh, uh, my son-in-law um, who uh, uh, is a, a a data scientist at Capital One in Richmond, Virginia, and they have three three children now. This was taken a year and a half ago, so there's a third child who's three months old as well. So we have a grandson whose name is Webb, and then and then two granddaughters. Um, the uh, I um, yeah, I've worked in the computer industry for thirty something years, thirty six years, uh, and uh, and did travel around the world and then have responsibility. I covered Coca Cola and all the ballers worldwide for. Uh, nine years. Uh, and that was, uh, and after nine years, I said, that's it, I'm done. And <laughs> traveling the world, meeting with everyone. It was a great time, but it was, uh, uh, it was, uh, it was tough as well. Um, when, I, when he said, when I was in high school, there were two Young Life leaders. There was a Young Life staff guy by the name of Brad Baker. And I kept seeing this guy around my high school and kept seeing this guy um, in, at uh, events going on at the school. And uh, he was always very friendly. Uh, my good friend Jim Miller and I were hanging out at a uh, church league basketball game and these girls were wandering by and we, you know, we had no money in our, in our pockets and we said, we said, where are y'all going? They said, we're going to a Young Life meeting. And I, we said, what's that? And they said, well, there'll be food there. And we said, we're in. So we went, I walked in and here was this guy standing up front 
that I've been seeing at my high school. His name, Brad Baker and I, we became great friends. There was another guy by the name of Randy Darcy, who was a young engineer, uh, graduated from Tennessee Tech and was working for Procter & Gamble in my hometown of Jackson, Tennessee, the only place where they make Pringles, by the way, in the United States. And he worked at the Pringles plant Randy and I have been friends, um, and Brad and I were friends until he passed away six years ago. Randy and I are still friends to this day. Randy retired as president of General Mills, um, and, uh, and so knowing him all through those years uh, was great. And he was also captain of his golf team at Tennessee Tech, so it was always fun to uh, play golf with him. There was a lot of instruction given to me um, when I was on the golf course. I was on the golf course playing um, – I was 35 years old and I was playing with a guy named Boyd Moore, who was an elder at our church in Fort, in Fort Worth. And, uh, and I can tell you where we were, it was March and we were walking off the second tee. We were carrying our clubs and walking at, uh, on this golf course. And he walks over next to me and you got to know Boyd. Boyd was a Vietnam vet, two tours in Vietnam. And he didn't have the back line story. He had the front line story and his stories would just mesmerize us. And so he said he would say stuff because he wanted to. He walked over next to me and he goes, hey, Ken, how are your quiet times going? How's your personal time with the Lord going? And I thought, quiet times. Man, I got a job and I'm over my head. I got three small children. I got a wife I'm trying to keep happy. And we just moved into a new house. What do you mean quiet times? I'm, I'm sure I blurted something out to him, but I have no idea. But I felt so convicted by that that I went home and I put in my calendar and I set up in my calendar times with the Lord. And I said, I'm going to do it every day. And I did that. And five weeks later, I'm playing with Boyd again. And now we're on the same golf course on the fourth hole. And he walks over to me beside me. And he goes, hey, Ken, what's the Lord trying to tell you these days? And my comment was, Boyd, I don't know, but he's trying to tell me something. The next week, I got a phone call. Ken, we'd like for you to apply for this manager job, the Southeast manager job. I was working for NEC at that time here in Atlanta, and they wanted me to move to Atlanta. And uh, he says, Ken, this job is yours, but there's going to be an interview process. Do you want it? And I thought, man, moving back, taking my wife even farther from Oregon, small children. Yeah, God was trying to tell me something. He was trying to tell me something, it was important that I listen and that I spent time with him. In John 15, Jesus says, I am the vine and you're the branches. You cannot do anything apart from me. And I was apart from him. I wasn't spending time with him. Oh yeah, I went to church. You know, I wasn't in a Bible study at that time and I was engaged. You know, I would have, you know, the great conversations with people, but I wasn't connected. And that's what I was trying, trying to understand. Because what does being connected mean? Does that mean you have to get up every, every morning early, early? You have to be like Martin Luther. You know, Martin Luther would spend an hour at least with the Lord every day. And if he had a busy day, he would spend two, to th two or three hours a day to make sure he was, he was ready. Does that mean you have to be early in the morning? My wife, she's from Oregon. She says she's still on Oregon time. So early in the morning is not her time. But she has time with the Lord every day. You know, what does that mean? Well, it's an all day thing. It's an all day thing, being connected to the vine all day. I used to tell, uh, tell uh, high school kids that uh, it's like you're at Dunwoody High School and there's this new kid, this new kid goes, hey, I wanna be your good friend. And you say, yeah, I wanna be your friend too. Let's get together, let's spend some time together. I said, great. So you go down there to near Perimeter Mall and you hang out, you get something to eat at Chipotle and then you go to at Target and you wander around for an hour looking at stuff at Target. And then you go back to your basement and play video games for three hours. But the entire time you're with this person, you don't say a single word to them. What is that person going to think? They're going to think, this is the weirdest person I've ever been around. What is wrong with this person? I don't think he gets it. And the idea is, is that God is with you all the time, all the time. Yet we act like he's not there. You know, it is a issue that we know who God is, but so many times we live as a practical atheist separate from who we know God is. 
not as an atheist, but as a practical atheist, because we do the things that we think we need to do, and we forget about who God really is. I'm doing a study with some young men from my church. They're all in their 20s. And we're studying the attributes of God. And God is 100% love. He's 100% sovereign. He's 100% present. He is 100% all-knowing. He is 100% of all these things. And any of these things that we think he's not, or we take a piece of that away, we just minimized God. And that's what we do every day in our lives. You know, it's all the time with God is key because it is his agenda, not ours. You know, the disconcerting issue is that we all know how to worship the gods we worship on a daily basis. Money. Oh, we'll figure out how to manage what we have better or we'll figure out how to make more. Power. We'll direct and force our will on other people. If necessary. Comfort. We'll find where to disappear for the weekend and sit on a porch while overlooking a, a lake. Entertainment, we'll go and do something that makes us, gives us a feeling of pleasure. Those are the gods that we have. Those are the gods that we know. And those are the gods that we can control. But God of the universe does not traffic in those. He traffics in a spiritual world. It is the fruits of the spirit that he wants us to grow in, which are love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. The God we serve changes our hearts toward him. The God we serve reminds us of what he has done for us. When we try to fit God into our narrative, when we try to fit God into what we want him to be, but instead God wants to fit us into his narrative because it's his narrative that's gonna win out. I learned this in a hard way. In 2010, I was uh, working for a software company um, with some guys that used to be at Microsoft and I was working for them. And uh, in the security software company, I managed the East Coast. I had salespeople and engineers. Um, and uh, on January, well, the previous year, 2009, we had a new president. And my, my boss reported to the president. January 5th, 2010, um, that president fired my boss and everybody that reported to him. 2009, 2010 was not a great economy time. It wasn't a time to try to go find another job, but I thought I've always had a job. I'll do this. This is no, no, no biggie. I can make this happen. I can go find another job. I know a lot of people. Well, if you fast forward to May, I hadn't had an interview, hadn't been invited to an interview. Hadn't had a job offer, nothing. And I would sit, I was spending a lot of time on my back porch on email, phone calls, but also a lot of time with the Lord. And I do, I have, I started something a handful of in year, 15, 20 years ago where I would write out prayers in a journal and I would just write them out. It's better for me to pay attention, to stick to something, to write it out. And, and then for me to go back years later and read them makes me like chuckle sometimes. But, but I was sitting there and I was writing in May on my journal, Lord, I don't know why I'm going through this. Why are you trying, what are you trying to teach me? You know, all the money's going out the door. I got a daughter in college, another one going to college. One of them out at, at least, but she's probably going to end up getting married. Why are you, what are you trying to tell me? And so I wrote in there, I said, God, whatever you want from me, I'm all in. I'm all in. It's a, you just use me however you want to use me. The next week, the next week I um, was uh, driving on Village Park, Dunwoody Village Parkway, stopped at the red light there by Mellow Mushroom. And I got a text message from our area director for, uh, from Young Life, Allison McCarthy. She was too scared to call me, so she texted me. And her text message was, hey, I've got some boys going to Young Life camp uh, next month, and we don't have a guy leader to go with them. The guy leader can't go, he has to go to a wedding. We, and since you don't have a job, would you be willing to go? <laughs> <laughs> and uh, 
I texted her back and I, and, and I look at the red light and I can, I remember looking at that red light. And every time I look at that red light, it reminds me. And I said, no, God, that's not what I'm looking for. And so I texted her back, no, not interested. And I got home and I was home for a little while and I felt bad. So I texted her, I said, call me, let's talk about it. So we talked about it. My wife and I talked about it. We prayed about it and said, hey, can you not do anything else? You might as well go. And, um, and the interesting thing was, is that uh, in first part of May, I had declined, or April, I had declined the COBRA coverage. I had no insurance. <laughs> I'm thinking, I'm going to get another job. I had no insurance. I'm going, okay, I'm going to go to a Young Life camp with no insurance. <laughs> this is a disaster. So, um, so I went to that Young Life camp, and there were four boys in that cabin. And, uh, and there were also 13 girls, and they, Errol Allison McCarthy, and another leader by the name of Kelly Jakaitis, who's a nurse here in town. And uh, they had the girls, and I had these four boys. And um, uh, all of them from Dunwoody High School. And it was a great week. Um, my wife and I, we were talking about how we had lived with our, with our kids in this bubble, Christian bubble. My wife's a high, high school art teacher at Providence Christian Academy, where our kids went to school. It was this bubble we lived in. And being around um, kids who were not churched, who, uh, who didn't know any, anything about the, the love of Christ was just eye-opening to me. But also just the pain that these kids, as kids, were going through. There was a girl there by the name of Joy. And as the week went on, we had a free time, and she, she, she wanted to tell me her story. And um, so we sat down over by the snack bar, and she was... Uh, she wanted to tell me that um, when she was going in the eighth grade, she's an only child and that her dad had a new job in California and he was going to go take the new job in California and her mom and her were going to sell the house and then join him in California. So two days later, he packed up the car and he left. They sold the house about eight weeks later, transferred the money and Joy has never seen him again. And she said, every time the speaker says, Heavenly Father, my stomach hurts. I mean, what do you tell Joy? Well, that week, Joy decided to follow Christ. And we give every young believer a Bible. She said, this is the first time I've ever held a Bible in my hand. And watching her grow and through the years, graduate college, get married to a fine Christian guy in Birmingham and go into that wedding was just the greatest thing to see happen. It's tremendous. There was a boy in there by the name of John, um, John Lima, a uh, football player at Dunwoody. He was gonna be a junior in high school. John and I became close that week. Um, John decided he wanted to follow Christ. And we prayed together and um, sat and talked for long periods, long, long periods about what he had been going through. His dad died. He's a DACA kid, come here from Brazil uh, with his stepfather and his mother and his older brother. Um, John um, was uh, really wanting to understand who he was. So after we got back, we started a week where we did every night we had a Bible study with all those kids that said they wanted to follow Christ. We started a Bible study for that week, every night. And then we continued one, one night a week for, for the rest of the summer. Well, the summer is coming to close and uh, John is at middle of August and John said, Hey Ken, are you, are you going to be a regular young life leader now? Are you going to like come to young life clubs and stuff like that? And I said, well, I don't think so. You know, it's, I'm a little too old for that, and, uh, but, uh, and John goes, but Ken, you're my best friend. And I said, John, we got to find you better friends. <laughs> and I said, here's the deal, John, I'm going to come to football practice this week. And if you introduce me to some of the other guys, maybe I'll stick around. And he goes, all right, what day you come? And I said, okay, I'll be there Wednesday at 530. He goes, all right, great. Well, I show up, I didn't realize I was dealing with probably the mayor of Dunwoody because he knew everybody. And he introduced me to everybody. Here's Sly, here's Doug, here's 
the Dazel, there's Malik, you know, and just everybody there. Elliot, there's all these guys. He's, he's, and the coaches and the athletic director, Chan English. I'm, I'm, I'm meeting everybody. That was, that was, and I thought, okay, he held up his end of the bargain. I better hold up mine. So if you fast forward, John lived in the apartments down off Shamley Dunwoody at 285. All his friends lived in those apartments and apartments on Peach, off of Peachtree Industrial. I spent the next three, four years living in those apartments, getting to know the moms. It was, it was just a eye-opening experience for us. I mean, we had a deal one time where they were trying, they were going to raise money to go to camp the next summer. We're going to Colorado. And I had all these guys helping help them raise money, doing little jobs. And this one lady wanted us to move stuff from her basement to her attic that had been, you know, fixed up so she could store stuff up there. And all the boys wanted to go look at the attic. Can, can we go up there and look at the attic? And I'm thinking, what are we going to look at the attic for? Then it dawned on me, these boys had never seen an attic. They only lived in apartments. <laughs> Those little things, when, when they didn't know where lunch was coming from, when they didn't know where the next meal at their home was coming from, it was an eye-opening experience to Janet and I who were worried about comfort because comfort had become our idol. John um, was not the only kid there. There were... There were 15 to 20 kids on our back porch uh, that summer. And um, there was one girl who was at camp and she was telling her boyfriend, um, he goes, hey, you ought to meet this guy, Ken. You know, he's old and he's awkward, but he's nice. <laughs> You'll like him. And he's thinking, I don't think I like him. Um, so he shows up and his name was Kurt. And uh, Kurt was, uh, um, after our first night, he wanted to talk to me and we're standing there on my back porch talking. And he said, I went to vacation Bible school in the fifth grade and I prayed this prayer to accept Christ. And I've been praying to God, but I'm really not sure who God is. He goes, would you help me understand that? And I said, absolutely. So I ran upstairs and I guess I said, here's a basic Christianity book. And you have a Bible, I want you to read the first chapter of this basic Christianity book and the first three chapters of the book of John. He goes, okay, that sounds good. And I said, you do that and then we'll get together. And that was on Sunday night. Monday night, he texts me and he says, okay, I'm ready to get together. I said, did you read what I told you to read? He goes, oh, I finished both books. Okay, great. <laughs> when do you want to meet? He goes, tomorrow morning at 6.30, Panera Bread. I go, okay. <laughs> So I go to Panera Bread, 6.30 in the morning. I walk in and he's got his Bible in this basic Christianity book and he has post-it notes sticking out of it. And I'm thinking, oh golly, I need coffee. <laughs> and we sat and we talked. And over the next 18 months, he read every book of the Bible. Matter of fact, the next summer, we're visiting my in-laws in Oregon. It's 11.30 at night. We'd flown in, we're just getting to bed. And I get a text message from Kirk. It's 2.30 in Atlanta. I'm not up. And his text message is, hey, could you explain this verse in Malachi to me? And I go, good night, Kurt. And I put my phone <laughs> so it was that type of thing with Kurt. Kurt went to University of Illinois on, a, on an academic scholarship, was a volunteer young life leader, president of his fraternity, president of the business club, and then president of the interfraternity council. He works for a financial group in Chicago. He married a girl he met at church in Chicago. It was great to be a part of that wedding. And he's a, they are together, volunteer young life leaders in South Chicago. Yes, they have great stories. I asked the, I asked the young life director there after American Man, I said, so how is Kurt, this nerdy, awkward guy, <laughs> doing so well with these kids? He goes, you know, he is, a, he is a speck of salt in a room full of pepper, and they love him. They love him. And we had all these kids hanging around us and it wasn't us that they loved. It was the fact that we just showed them Jesus. And in a living in a world of subjectivity, they were able to see an objective truth and be able to hang on to that. We tried to teach, make sure we taught them how to spend time with the Lord and do that consistently. 
I asked him, I said, hey, you spend all your time on your phone. If I text you a verse every morning, would you read it? And they go, yeah. So at one point, I was texting 92 kids every morning a verse so that they would get consistent about reading something and have a heart and a love for the Lord. And that is what, that was part of what we learned there. You know, these kids have lived in this, what has been referred to as a digital Babylon, because there's all this information out there and they're getting a lot of information. They're just not getting wisdom. And it's important that they spend time in the word for the wisdom. Um, we, have a, we have a blackboard wall in our house that kids that come to our house sign them. And Janet and I sit there and we can tell you the story of all those kids and just stories about them. And that was a uh, tremendous time. Um, there's a kid, African-American kid named Pat Smith and we went to Colorado that next summer. And Pat's mom was a, a crack mother. He was a crack baby. And when he was born, he was handed to his grandparents. Um, he has never seen a picture of his father. No idea what his father looks like. And uh, we've sat and cried about that. I've cried with other boys about the same issue. And, but in Colorado that summer, Pat saw a love and an, and an adoption into a family that Christ offered. And he stood up, we have a thing called say-so night. At the end of the camp, they stand up, you know, let the redeemed say so, it says in Psalm. So he, so he stood up and he said, he said, I don't know my earthly father, but now I know my heavenly father. What can you do about that? He now, he now is a FedEx driver down in Mobile, Alabama, married, um, and just uh, trying to be the father he, he wasn't. He did not get to see. Um, you know, that's, uh, there's many guys I've just tried to spend time with, um, just, uh, you know, discipleship, uh, teaching them how to understand, how to explain what they believe. I always spent the last year with, uh, with guys that I have really understanding what they believe, you know, why they believe that and how to explain that to somebody else. And I always, always frame it in this way. I said, well, someday there's going to be a girl sitting across from you at a table and she's going to say, what do you believe about God? And if you stumble around, you, you know, you know, and you're thinking this is the one, you, you, that may not work out. So I'm going to make sure you understand what to say. Um, some of those guys can still tell me their, the acronyms that I've taught them. And uh, it's just, it, and that is amazing. You know, following Christ is taking up your cross and following him every day. Because Jesus says, take up your cross, deny yourself, and follow me. Everybody knows about Peter. The night he was betrayed, the night Jesus was betrayed, and the night that Jesus denied, and Peter denied him. You know, because Peter's there in the upper room, and he says, you guys are going to scatter. You're going to run. And Peter goes, not me. I don't know about these other, you know, guys, but not me. And Jesus goes, no, no, you're going to deny me three times for the cock crows. And Jesus goes, what? and Peter goes, what are you talking about? No way. So then they, then they come, the chief priest comes, you know, and he's got his guard with him. And Peter, you know, decides to bow up and he cuts the ear off of the, of the guard. And Jesus goes, no, this isn't it. And heals the ear. Jesus is taken away. He's being scourged, questioned, and Peter is questioned. And he's asked three times, weren't you with him? Aren't you one of his? Aren't you one of his? And every time Peter said, no, no, no. And then after he said no for the third time, the cock crowed. And in one of the gospels, it said that his eyes met Jesus's. Woof, think about that one. And, and he ran away crying. And he was disrupted. Jesus comes back. I mean, Peter goes to the tomb. Jesus comes back. He rises from the dead. This is what he said he would do. 
and he appears to everybody, but he never has an intimate conversation with Peter about what Peter did. And Peter's having this hard time. And there's that morning that he goes, I'm going to go fishing. Maybe this Jesus thing didn't work out and I'm just going to go fishing. And they get in the boat and they push out and they start fishing. There's a person on the shore saying, hey, why don't you try cast a net on the other side? And they're going, wait a second, we've been told this before. And they start pulling the net up and the net starts to break. And they pull it in. There's so many fish. And, G and Peter goes, it's the Lord. And he jumps in the water and is trying to beat the boat back to the shore. And when he gets back, Jesus restores him. Ask him three times, do you love me? And Peter goes, no, he knows why three times. But a lot of the times that story stops right there. But there's more to it. Jesus then said, um, said to him, he said, I say to you, when you were young, you used to dress yourself and walk wherever you wanted. But when you were old, you will stretch out your hands and another will dress you and carry you where you do not want to go. He says, this is, he said, to show by what kind of death he was to glorify God. And after this, he said to him, follow me, Peter, follow me. They're walking along. Peter turns and looks back and he sees John behind him. It says, Peter turned and saw the disciple whom Jesus loved following them, the one who had also leaned back against him during the supper and has said, and said, who Lord is going to betray you? When Peter saw John, he turned to Jesus and said, Lord, what about this guy? What about him? What about him? And Jesus says, if it is my will that he remain until I come, what is that to you? You follow me. You know, he's going, high school kids love this. It's all about peer pressure. You want me to follow Jesus? What about him? And Jesus goes, no, no, this is between you and me, Peter. Peter, this is between you and me. And actually, if you, and it says, you follow me. And if you go back to the original language and you just directly uh, translate it, it comes out, you, me, follow. You, me, follow. It means follow me. It's just between you and me. For eternity, it's just going to be between you and me. It's not about anybody else. It's not about what anybody else has or does or what they're up to. That's between me and them. This is between you and me. You, me, follow. And he calls all of us and he says, you, me, follow. Follow me. Deny yourself. Deny your own will and follow my will. This is what he calls. And he teaches us this. And he will teach us these the easy way or he'll teach us this the hard way. It wasn't easy for 10 years being the old guy, which one guy, one boy at uh, Dunwoody High School, who's now a junior at Georgia, always referred to me as the oldest man in Dunwoody. He would introduce me to people as the oldest man in Dunwoody. And the, and the people would look, look at me and go, I don't think he's the oldest man. In <laughs> but uh, that, that was... These way these these you know being with these kids was just so fun, but it was so difficult because a young life leader, it's all about being incarnational, is being with the kids. I went to lunch, I'd go sit in the in the picnic area. I had to swallow my own pride to go sit in you know with the high school kids, which was you know, and some high school kids didn't want me there. Go in the lunchroom, sit down. They didn't want me there. Teachers going, what in the world is this old guy doing here? Go in the football games and the basketball games. I am sitting in the student section, sitting in the student section. One basketball game, the, the referee is trying to get on the good side of the student section. So he's kind of there talking to him and he's, you know, just chatting away. And he starts scanning the student section. And he, see, look, he sees me and he comes back like, what is that guy doing here? But that's where, that's where I was and that's where I wanted to be. And it was, it was that, type of, that type of sacrifice that, that Christ was calling me to. It was denying myself. That was not myself. That was Christ in me that did that. And the kids saw that Christ in me. And Jesus wanted to remind me that it's not just that, but it's every day that he lives in me and that I live for him. So 
So if we look at, uh, put down some, um, um, some verses on the slides here um, that, that if you remember, those are two of the verses I spoke about. I am the vine, you are the branches, John 15, five. Whoever abides in me and I in him, he, he it is that bears much fruit for apart from me, you can do nothing. And then Luke 9, 23, Jesus said to all, if anyone come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross daily and follow me. Take up his cross daily and follow me. Not my will, but your will be done. And then next, next uh, slide, I have some questions for you guys to consider. And this is for y'all to consider personally. How are your personal times with God? Are you aware who God is, aware who God really is? Or are you minimizing him and living as a practical atheist? That's, that is a question I ask myself every day. What part of God did I just minimize today? What part of God did I just minimize? And are you open to whatever God has for you? Whatever God has for you. We were, you know, I actually took a job at the end of that summer, 2010, for much less than I was doing before. Much lower job. But it was the right thing. And Jan and I were talking about, should we be living here? And Janet came to me and she said, hey, I would live with you in a double wide in the North Georgia mountains. And I thought, ooh, the pressure's off. <laughs> <laughs> but the question is, whatever, she said, whatever God has for us, that's where we're going to go. And then four, in the, in, in the quote of uh, my dear friend who's passed away, Boyd Moore, what is God trying to tell you these days? He's trying to tell you something. He is working in your heart in some way. Tim Keller, uh, the pastor in New York said that if you're not troubled about following Jesus, maybe it's not Jesus you're following. Let me close the word of prayer. Lord, thank you for these men. Thank you for their desire to follow you. Lord, I just ask that you just work in each man's heart, that you uh, just call them to you, pull them to you, give them the desire to spend time with you. Lord, we just ask that you just uh, be with us as men, and the difficulty and the pressures that we have that we put upon ourselves, Lord, remind ourselves that you were there with us and that you do fight the fight for us. In your son's name we pray. Amen. So, guys, um, either here we have a microphone in the room or online. Uh, if any uh, and all, I guess, questions uh, for Ken, um, we're going to kind of open it up and um, hopefully you can share some more great wisdom with us. So, thank you. Yeah, uh, we have a question here in the room. Some of the boys referred to acronyms that you talked about. What are Charlotte's? Yeah, so yeah, you're asking about the acronyms um, for. Um, uh, what you believe, why you believe it. Well, the acronym for the, uh, um, you know, the authenticity of scripture is called the MAPS acronym. And that's been around for a while. Some of you guys may have seen that. So really it's the manuscripts. So how the manuscripts were written and the time, uh, closeness of time that we have original manuscripts, but also the, the fact that these manuscripts were written over so many hundreds of years by different authors, so many different authors in different languages, yet they are very consistent in the message, and uh, which, is, uh, which is amazing. Number two is archeology. span Archeology span uh, um, has been pro is proving things from the Bible as opposed to disproving. So they, um, they have found things that archeologists said this, you know, things were in the Bible, but this isn't true because we don't have no archeological proof of this. And then they would find archeological proof of cities, of locations, of people, um, and then P was prophecies. So all the prophecies in the Old Testament that were pointing toward either things in the Old Testament or toward Jesus Christ, the birth and life and the resurrection of Jesus Christ, all those prophecies coming true was, uh, um, is really um, 
amazing and um, in many different ways. It's uh, the mathematical, my, my son-in-law, um, who's the, who's a master's in, st in statistics. He can, he can explain the, uh, the mathematical probability of those prophecies coming true, but those are really, those type of, of, of teaching around, uh, around really being able to explain that and why you believe it's true yourself is, is very, very important. And again, what, what's, the, what's the name of the thing on Sunday night that my son, you know, we do it all in nice place with you. <laughs> Uh, well, we called it campaigners. Campaign. So Young Life used to be called the Young Life Campaign. So it was like a, and it was almost like a, um, you know, a tent, you know, revival type thing was kind of the idea when they put it together. It was actually, it was founded by a guy named Jim Raybird in 1941 in Gainesville, Texas. And he was hired as a youth pastor and they told him that his, he said, you know, we're the youth of the church. And the pastor goes right there at that high school. That's where they are. Go find them at that high school. And that's where the Young Life campaign started. Um, and, uh, and so that's the whole direction of that. But that was called Campaigners. And it was Bible study. Um, and really the Bible study was really teaching them an objective truth in a subjective world, really, as we live in. Uh, but it's also pointing them to Christ and, and, to, and to who Christ is. Um, you know, Ben was uh, one of those kids that I would say something three weeks ago and I'd be talking. I said, do you guys remember? And then Ben would just quote me word for word. And I, I don't know how he did that. But uh, yes. How important was it you had a theological background when you did it? <laughs> that's, a, that's a great question. The um, you know, I, I did attend seminary. I read a lot. I used to travel worldwide and I'd take a handful of books to read. And uh, um, the, but, but that's not important. You know, the important part is, is that, um, you know, kids just want to um, see somebody cares. Do you appear genuine to these kids the way I view it, more so than the theological way? It yeah. was a real deal. You weren't in this for anything for yourself. Mm -hmm. It was okay. I got something to share. You guys want to listen? You know, it was it was an interesting thing because we had a football game one night. Uh, Keith Hicks is he here? No, he's not here. So so we're at a football game one night. Janet and I are in the student section because my wife got pulled in two years later. We had next thing you know, we were having a hundred something kids come to Young Life. We didn't have enough leaders, so they pulled my wife in, and she had she walked through four years with a group of girls. But but we were in a, a, a football game. And we're down in the student section and the game's over, we're walking away. And Keith walks up and he goes, okay, do you talk to them about what they want to talk about or about what you want to talk about? <laughs> he goes, because Emily doesn't talk to us very much. So what do you talk to them about? And I, you know, I said, you know, I, we're just there. It's just being there, showing up is, you know, as Woody Allen said, you know, 99% of life. Well, it's just, you know, that's it. So it's like, we just wanted to be there. Um, and they would s consistently see us over and over and over. And, and then it became this trust. Um, we, I, I mean, I have kids that do have never darkened the door of a church and never accepted Christ that I'm still friends with today. And it's just being there with them. Yeah. Paul. So, okay, thanks for being here. Uh, um, you know, a lot of us have kids that are now in their twenties and thirties, and uh, we still care. Mm -hmm. They don't care as much, it seems. <laughs> yes, oh, I'm sorry. Yes, yeah. Go ahead. Well, uh, well so you know, our, if, if we still want to be involved, we want to help our kids continue to steer them down the path that we know is the right path. Mm -hmm. And they're older, and they think for themselves now. Yes. You got any tips for an old man? <laughs> and yeah, we have a lot of parents of younger kids. I was yeah. going to ask the same. How do you relate to your kids, younger or older, or spiritual? So, so how do you? So the question is, how do you relate to your kids or talk to your kids now that they're out of the home or are in, you know, in their twenties and thirties and and forties, uh, and uh, and how do you relate to kids that they're still at home? And and I think that um, it is a. <laughs> I have three daughters, 
um, they, they and their mom are best friends. And I'm like the outcast of this gang at my home and you growing up. So, but Janet was always very consistent in speaking truth in their life all the time, truth all the time in their life. And, and one of them, they, they, you know, we would, she would, they would ask a question and, you know, be upset about something. And Janet would say, well, you know that, and they, they go, wait a second is the answer Jesus? If it is, I already, I'm just going to walk away right now. So it's like, but that's, that's kind of, that's what, what they dealt with. But it's like, I have three daughters. Uh, I had the youngest one is in Brooklyn, New York. And, and she, we would say she is not following Christ right now. Now she knows the truth and she speaks the truth to us, but she is, I would say she's not following Christ. So Janet and I pray for her, pray for her. You know, if you look in the Bible, there are God willed on, you know, he would just change people's hearts. It's not our work. It's God's work in their lives. We have to pray that God will continue to work in their life. And, and, and many times, you know, as a parent, you know, we try to coax something or push something some way. And, and the kids just want to go the other direction because they want to, to go something different than what their parents have done. But it's important that you pray for them and tell them that you're praying for them. And how can I pray for you? How can I pray for you today? How can I pray for you this week? And know that you're praying for them. That is a different level of caring. Down here going, hey, I need 20 bucks to get, you know, today or I need some rent money or something. That's another caring. But the caring is saying, I am taking your cares to the Lord. And I am praying for you on a constant basis. And that is a, another level. It was, it, it was amazing. The kids, the kids that, we, that we've spent time with, the kids whose parents would talk about their faith with them while they're in the home, you could see the difference. Because the kids that, the kids that heard their parents' faith, whether or not they actually like they listened or not, <laughs> But the kids that heard their parents talk about their faith, they, they would embody that themselves. How did, you know, uh, you obviously live, you know, to say more of your faith on your sleeve, part of your everyday life from moment day one in your professional career. How did that impact or manifest itself in, you know, traveling the world and dealing with yeah that was that's interesting because um yeah so how, being a business person um and in business and uh wearing my faith on my sleeve as uh, as michael was saying the the question is how do you uh how do you do that you know how did that manifest itself in business um i would um uh, you know you know, Francis Schaeffer said, share the gospel at all times and when necessary, use words. So um, I would use words um, in sparingly in the right times. Um, but people could see by how I lived that was different because people would come to me and want to have a conversation with me. Um, but then some people would come to me and also want to have a conversation as to why they did not <laughs> go to church or why they did not believe there was a God, which was, which was fine too. I, you know, I was, I just listened and I wasn't, I wasn't trying, you can't argue somebody into Christianity. That's just, that is a very huge truth, but being willing to listen uh, and being willing, willing to hear is, is important. Um, I think in business, it was just living what I believe. Um, and, and that's another thing, talking about how many golf courses I played. I used to, when I was a young, a young salesperson working for NEC, I had four states, Oklahoma, Arkansas, Texas, and Louisiana. I was the only person for all four states. Those are not small states. And I would travel around, and back, this is back when there were computer stores. Remember computer stores? And, uh, and we had our computers in computer stores, and I would go travel around. Well, at the end of the day, I didn't want to go to the bar. It just wasn't me. 
And so I would find, I would get to know the salespeople in these computer stores who like to play golf. And we would go play golf till dark. And, and I played golf all over the place with these guys. It was just, it was fun. You know, those people in Southern Louisiana, I'm still not sure what they were talking about, but it was fun, you know, being with them. So, um, but that was, but that, that was part of that, is that that was me, you know, living my faith and not being, not doing something that I, you know, really did not see was the right thing to do. Um, you know, um, it was, um, it was the fact that it was interesting because one, one exec, um, told me, I know where you stand. Therefore, there's no question in my mind as to where you stand. So therefore, if I give you something, I know, you know, your credibility is going to hold up and that, and those type of things I think were, that was interesting. Yeah. But it was also interesting spending time with high school kids and then also trying to go to the business world and have business conversation. And then I used a vernacular. One time I was in a meeting and I used the high school vernacular. I can't remember what it was I said exactly, but I used some high school t- and everybody looked at me at the table like, what? I go, oh yeah, let me rephrase that. So, um, but that kind of thing happens. Yes. You know, that was, uh... <clears throat> Yes. Yeah, the question is how, how do you how do you measure or actually spend so much time in ministry or do things in ministry at the same time also you have home and you have work and and uh, then your own personal spiritual walk as well um it was interesting because when this started my youngest went to college so we were all of a sudden empty nesters for the first time and next thing you know we had all these kids showing up and going to these things all these kids um and all these facebook posts with us you know at camps with these kids and our daughters came one time they go you know, we're your children. <laughs> Those kids are not your children. <laughs> Don't forget. But how do you do that? How do you do that? And that is, you know, um, you know, I, I really believe um, in a few things. No, number one is, is that you have to lean on God's wisdom, right? Lean on God's wisdom. Um, and then, and then you have to lean on God's wisdom to measure your time so like during I was spending so much time I had work going on and I was spending so much time with young life kids my golf game just fell apart because I wasn't playing golf at all it's less, less it was high school kids that's when I would uh, go play but I didn't play you know any golf and it was just it fell apart and it was but it wasn't important so therefore the things that are not important seem to fade away um, and it's important to really lean on God's wisdom um, you know I I hold to an axiom that I really taught the kids, and I really believe this, that what it is you believe, you know, what whatever beliefs, but what is whatever you believe affects the way you think, and the way you think affects the way you feel, and the way you feel affects the way you live. So many people start talking about, you know, you would talk to kids or even adults, and you say, well, you know, what's going on here? Well, I feel this. Well, obviously you're thinking something, which is also, which came from a belief system. What is that belief? If you believe God is eternal and is sovereign and is, you know, with us all the time and is holy and truthful, then that affects the way you think and it affects the way you feel and it affects the way you live. And you can see how people live based upon all the way back to what they believe. And I think that that's, and I've spent a lot of time talking that through with kids and, and adults too. You know, what do you, and guys usually start, start with the think, well, I think this, and you know, and there's no women here. Women start with the, I feel. <laughs> and so it's, it's important that we really get back to what is it you believe that is causing this way you think and the way you feel. Any other questions? Well, I want to thank you guys. This was uh, 
Uh, I've been here for, I've taught a couple of Sunday school classes here, uh, adult Sunday school classes, and, uh, and uh, Michael called me and I said, well, at least they want me to come back, so I guess it's okay. <laughs> but thank you very much for your time, and if you want to talk to us, if, you, if, you, if anybody yeah. wants to talk one-on-one -on -one or anything like that, I'm also available for coffee or lunch or breakfast. Uh, I do that a lot. I did that with high school kids, but we went to Waffle House so much and about, and I think it it shot my blood pressure up. And uh, but you know, but anything's fine. Thanks, Kevin. Okay. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Good.